university is keen to try and develop a program called the Woodland Recovery Initiative, um, which is about securing the biodiversity in the Mount Lofty region. Now, the Mount Lofty region is the Mount Lofty ranges plus the plains on either side because that's actually the unit that the system operates at. Now, this region was settled um, by free settlers back in the 1830s and we were very good at clearing vegetation. Within 20 years of colonisation here, by 1856, a chap called von Muller came to this region and across the Adelaide Plains, he could not believe how drastically changed an Australian landscape to a European one um, it had been. In 1980, this state actually stopped vegetation clearance with its Native Vegetation Act. This gives an indication of the quantity of vegetation that remains within this region, and it's largely along the spine of the Mount Lofty Ranges, and most of the plains nearby had been totally cleared. Overall, there's a total of just 7% of this region that still has native vegetation on it. In this region, the lower elevation areas are actually the good quality lands, and in those regions, just 2% of the original vegetation remains. If you go up into high elevations, up to the actual uh, spine of the ranges at around 450 uh, metres and above, you have a relatively, a relatively large amount left, about 16%. This shows the numbers of species of birds that can live in different areas of woodland. For the Mount Lofty Ranges, which is around about 750,000 hectares, you would expect to have about 110 woodland bird species. If we now go down to where we actually have our so-called conservation parks and the native vegetation which exists, the prediction is that we'll lose 50 to 60 of those 110 bird species. They'll disappear. These are 10 bird species that are no longer within this region and probably of those at best maybe three of those could perhaps recolonise. We actually have very good evidence to show that there's another 60 species of woodland birds that are actually declining. The other species I'll illustrate for you, it's very hard to get long term data sets for changes in these species is this sweet little bird known as a scarlet robin. And you'll notice from a couple of data sets here that in the 1960s, for that decade, it accounted for about 1% of the individual birds caught and it drops to substantially fewer, one one hundredth. Second data set, slightly different areas, also a tenfold difference. If you pull those two data, this species, in terms of its relative proportion, has dropped tenfold. And most of the other species, we can tell you, are also declining, so it's a much greater reduction than simply uh, those numbers suggest. We, this generation, has an opportunity to change that around because what we can do is actually, that's where our vegetation is now, if we can actually put back some habitat, maybe to 30%, we've got a reasonable chance to keep a reasonably high proportion of those bird species still in this landscape. Natural woodlands are complex, lots of different plant species, several eucalypts in the overstory, a range of other medium-sized trees, small trees and shrubs, but also a whole lot of understory plants too. But they've also got other structures there, fallen timber, horizontal branches, uh, dead wood on the ground, bare patches, patches with litter, other grassy areas, and they make complex habitats, and it's these complex habitats that actually enable more species to be able to live within them. And these are the types of habitats that we need to reconstruct across the Mount Lofty Ranges to prevent some of the species from disappearing in the future. Most of the revegetation programs that are currently taking place consist of planting trees in rows, um, maybe only three or four species. They're all planted at the one time. The rows may only be two or three metres apart. And there might be three or four trees coming up per metre along each row. These trees will all grow almost like poplars. They won't have, when they're mature, lateral branches. They will not mimic the habitats that are used by uh, wildlife, the natural habitats, which have a great mix of species and also have great structural diversity within the trees that are present. And ideally what one should be doing here is planting over a number of years to get an age distribution and to get a much patchier distribution to the plants. So if we looked at current revegetation programs, we can summarise them as follow. Limited species or floristic diversity, numbers of plant species. They're too small in area. 
They're limited for structural diversity. Lateral branches might be missing. They've got high plant densities, far too high. You need to spread them out more compared to natural systems. And there tends to be both poor um, tree and uh, patch architecture, branches and canopy shapes and so forth. The first question I'd be asking, which people don't ask, how much habitat do birds need? There's some work done by Joel Allen out near Monato, and it shows the home ranges of individually tagged birds during about a two-week period. Varied satellas, 254 hectares, contains where the individual was during a two-week period. For restless flycatchers, 185 hectares, and for brown-headed honey, it's 66 hectares of woodland systems. None of our revegetations get close to that scale. Are large revegetation programs any better? Out at Monato, there is a large revegetation scheme. The Monato revegetation program commenced about 30 years ago and involved planting uh, rows and rows of trees, rows of four to five metres apart, trees four to five metres apart. But it's actually involved a large number of different species, particularly eucalypts. It included something like 50 or 60 species of eucalypt from Western Australia, including some of the local uh, plant species as well. As a consequence of having the trees more spaced, there are horizontal branches for birds like robins to perch on. There's a much broader structural diversity in the habitat and great floristic diversity as well. These habitats, now that they're functioning, support around about 85% of the bird species that used to occupy this region prior to it being cleared for agriculture. So we now have a very firm conclusion we can say, if we're going to revegetate these um, landscapes for birds, then the size of the patches need to be larger. And I wouldn't even be looking at anything smaller than 20 hectares. And I'd probably say you probably shouldn't be looking at anything less than 100 hectares. That's what we should be doing. And we're not doing that at present. This is a superb fairy wren. Most of you probably know it as a blue wren. This is the male. Out in Monato, you can actually map its use of space within an area, um, and then you can represent how it uses that space with diagrams like this. These sorts of uh, bullseye type things here, another one up there, are the areas where that species spends most of its time. Areas outside this are areas which are used next most frequently, and then outside this other are areas used a little bit less and then lots of other areas which are not used. But you can represent its use of space like this. This is Hooded Robins. Here's its area of use within these systems here, and you'll notice that it's actually using areas which are a little bit different to those wrens. So immediately we now know that you can't do this notion of just planting something and assume that animals will use it. One actually has to start thinking about what does this bird actually need in these habitats to enable it to use it. We still don't know that information, but once we have it, we can actually start to design habitats to meet the different species. Glenthorne is a 208 hectare farm in the southern suburbs. It has other open space areas to the west, to the north, and also the Field River down here. So it strategically fits where if you do something there, there's a reasonable chance you can add other bits of habitat around it. And one of the great advantages of Glenthorne is that it's actually where most of the people live in South Australia, which is in the metropolitan area. And by having it in these regions, people can actually see what a woodland system is like. They can get ownership of it. They can be involved. And as a consequence, it means that they'll own the larger scale programs going on away from the city areas. Without this, it's going to be very difficult to have that long-term intergenerational ownership of the larger project, which is aimed at restoring habitats to a large part of the Mount Lofty Ranges. And this is what the woodland systems might look like. So instead of being grasslands, as you drive past on the main arterial road that drives past this place, you'll actually see fantastic woodlands like this. Now, my feeling is this, that if we don't do this, this is the opportunity, this is the place, and if we did that, then I think Glenthorne will become the key asset in delivering the biodiversity outcomes that South Australia needs. It will be the only significant program that addresses one of the state government's key policies, which is this state wants no species loss. 
And so for me, that's where the enthusiasm comes for this. If we can establish this, then we have got a program that will serve not our generation, but it will serve all future generations as well. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.